Hi, this is Greg from Explorer Maps in Missoula, Montana. We're excited to collaborate with the Trail Less Traveled, helping connect people and place through art and storytelling. Please be sure to use promo code MANDELA for your discount when visiting explorermaps.com. Welcome to the Trail Less Traveled, an adventure radio series and podcast dedicated to collecting stories and sounds from around the world in order to take you back to mankind's earliest form of entertainment, storytelling. This episode was recorded on location in collaboration with Explorer Maps. Missoula, Montana is a mecca for outdoor enthusiasts, and each week we will bring you tales of adventure from both near and far, as well as information and inspiration and a few tunes to set the mood. You can subscribe to the podcast and learn about our international outreach projects at traillesstraveled.net. And now, here's your host, international expedition guide, conservationist, and yogi, Mandela. Today, the Trail Less Traveled is being recorded in southern Utah. I am in the offices of Zion National Park Forever Project, located in Hurricane, Utah. And I'm sitting here with Zach Almaguer, and he is the Director of Communications for Zion National Park Forever Project. First and foremost, Zach, thank you so much for joining me here today on the Trail Less Traveled. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for coming down the, the hill. I know you were up in the campsites in Zion, so I appreciate you making the journey. I, I felt a little bad asking you to come down and meet me, but uh, it's a beautiful drive, so I didn't feel that bad. It's a beautiful drive, no matter where you are, basically in this part of the world, it seems like, and it's so drastic to go from the red rocks and the sandstone to the mountains that I'm looking at as I look out the window right now. We're here at the head office in Hurricane. The Zion National Park Forever Project engages in collaborative efforts with federal agencies, gateway communities, and guests to create connections to the Zion regional landscape, leading to lifelong stewardship. By establishing business and agency partnerships, encouraging collaborative innovation, expanding educational opportunities, funding tangible projects, and leveraging resources, the Zion Forever Project is building the next generation of leaders and stewards. Tell us about your journey to Zion Forever Project. Yeah, that was less direct. Rural environments like Washington County don't offer many of the same stabilities that you might find in a larger city. Healthcare resources, education resources, and specifically jobs and economy. So it's a little more sensitive and sometimes more difficult to find your ground. We didn't know anybody when we moved here, but very early in my time here, uh, somebody gave me some good advice that if you wanted to work in the parks, near the parks, or with the parks in Utah, the best thing you could do is get a job in one of the gateway communities that's adjacent. And that's exactly what I did. I drove up into the town of Springdale, which is the southern gateway to Zion National Park. Maybe you've been through it recently since you're camping. It's about a three and a half, four mile gateway of small businesses right before you enter the park. And it has its own unique history that I think makes it different than other gateways. At the end of that gateway, there's a small hotel, one of our great partners. We really appreciate the support they provide. It's called the Cliff Rose Hotel and ended up taking a job there as one of their night managers, uh, working for a number of years outside of the fields I had been in previously. And then one day, uh, somebody from inside the park came in and said, hey, didn't you used to do something else? By the way, they're hiring. And that was essentially how I found myself. At the time, our organization was called Zion Natural History Association and then have been with the organization now since 2016. And we've been on a journey that included the rebranding to the name we hold now, the Zion National Park Forever Project. And we've held that moniker since 2017. With that new name, have taken essentially a mission that's existed since the early 1920s and brought it to a larger national stage. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Zach, let's talk about Zion. Let's honor Zion before we jump into the ways in which someone out there listening can help support the park and educational opportunities. There's lots to talk about. I mean, we could take it back 200 million years or we could just take it back 100 years or 10 years. But I was wondering if you could share with us what you're interested in and what you know about when it comes to Zion National Park. Yeah, selfishly, I'll tell you, it's a highly personal interest first and foremost. 
in my life, you know, as we all grow, we believe, we become more confident that we know more things or more confident in ourselves. And I thought I, maybe I had approached experiencing or understanding uh, what it meant to have a sense of place. And then Zion came along and really turned that on its head. I had never in my life stepped foot into an environment where I felt like I was home, but had never been there before. And Zion National Park was the first place in my life that I ever stood, looked all the way down that canyon at the infinite number of peaks as they just kind of drift off into infinity at the end and realized that I was home. And it was difficult because I was in a home that I knew very little about, but I was assured it was my home. And so my real passion for Zion is that in a way I can't describe beyond that, I feel like I'm supposed to be here. What I'm interested in has grown extensively because I have the pleasure in my role of getting to not necessarily be an expert in any of the subjects related to the park, but I get to work with an amazing cadre of subject matter experts, whether it be animals, plants, geology, uh, working with visitors, some of the economic concerns for small rural economies that we have here to ensure that these types of experiences are sustainable for national visitors to come and experience America's playground or America's greatest idea. What I'm interested in is sharing and telling the story of Zion. Very selfishly, my favorite thing is when somebody's never been to the park before is to be a part of that experience with them and feel as though I got to help somebody else have that welcome home feeling that I felt uh, about 12, 13 years ago, the first time I stepped into the park before we had moved out here. And so that's what I'm interested in. It's so much more than the projects. It's so much more than anybody's individual interest. I think it's just a feeling we all have. And if we talk about it too much, we might start to realize or think it's not the same. So I'll just leave it at it's, it's just a really strong feeling. It's really beautiful when you look at the name Zion, and the root of the name Zion comes from the Hebrew word for refuge. So it's really beautiful Mm -hmm. to hear you talk about it being a refuge for you, being at home for you. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. You know, that same refuge or sanctuary or whichever word you choose to apply from that Hebrew, that's exactly what it is. And not just for the human visitors. It is a sanctuary, as many national park sites are, almost a jar being placed over nature and held to allow it to play out, you know. Uh, The Forest Service, for instance, if you were to have a a forest fire, you know, they would talk about fire management and they may even extinguish the fire. In a national park, unless that fire was threatening perhaps life or critical infrastructure, we might allow that fire to burn. And I think that's what's so fascinating about national parks is they really are some of the last bastions where nature is just playing out as it should. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then, when you take it back and you look at the southern Paiute word, is it Mukuntui? Mukuntui, yeah. yeah. And, you know, so many varied definitions and interpretations of Mukuntui have been given to me from straight-up land, other textual definitions. I would hesitate to even speculate as to what the official meaning is, but Mukuntui, as shared with me by the Paiute tribal members that we work with, was and still remains the name as used by especially the ancestral people who came before, including the Paiute tribes who make up the significant Native American population here. Mm -hmm. I know that Zion total is claimed by more than 30 Native American tribes as being their ancestral homeland. So the Park Service itself has extensive formal relationships with all of these tribes. In fact, specifically one of the projects that our organization is supporting, you may have noticed when you came in a number of gift bags sitting on the floor, and in just a few weeks we'll be having an informal tribal gathering where members from many tribes will be coming, both to hear about park projects from park leadership and ourselves, but also provide their subject matter expertise on how those park projects should be managed and what the tribal perspective might be. So we're really excited because that's one way in which our organization helps support the park through these types of gatherings. The significant number 30, though, is a real testament that so many visitors to the park who maybe don't have that awareness have a full understanding 
that Native American culture is not one thing. It is a diverse array of people, mm -hmm. each with their own distinct backgrounds, each with their own distinct perspectives, and even within the tribe, each of them as individuals mm -hmm. who view each of those issues. And so seeing the volume of tribes involved is a real reminder that this land is Zion, is refuge, is sanctuary, uh, but that means something different for every visitor that steps into it. Yeah. Even within the tribes, uh, with individuals I've worked with, they themselves are very astute to point out that we might not even know full interpretations of things like names or even Native American writing or pictograph or petroglyphs that we might locate. You know, all of that is very interpretable depending on the tribal perspective. Today the trail has traveled is being recorded in southern Utah. We are at the offices of Zion National Park Forever Project here in Hurricane Utah. And I'm sitting with Zach Almagar. He is the Director of Communications for Zion Forever Project. So Zach, this is an international audience listening. And I'm just curious if you could give a taste. What's the history with Zion? Why is it so special to the millions of park visitors every year and to the indigenous communities of the area? Yeah, you know, I had the same question because when I arrived here, I looked around and I was like, wow, this place is special. I think you see it too. It's just right in front of your face. So one of the things that rangers say that I love is, you know, geology is everywhere. The difference is here, it's just very visible. Um, all of the geology is fully exposed. You know, your question's an interesting one. What makes it so special for some people, we could dive deeply into, but what makes this area really special geologically, visually, if you're wondering what makes people go, wow, we can talk about it briefly from the lay science perspective I have, but basically what we're witnessing here is the perfect intersection of three massive formations. You have the Mojave Desert coming out of the south. Uh, you have the Great Basin Range coming up from the north. And then, of course, the Colorado Plateau, which literally terminates on the cliff edge as we see here. You know, this is not a jab at Colorado. We have no 14,000-foot peaks here in Utah. But most people come and say, but your mountains look so much bigger. And, well, that's because Colorado is already all the way up on the plateau. We're shaved off. And if anybody is into measuring mountains, I guess that would be the difference between elevation versus prominence and dominance for measurement. The Colorado Plateau, which is shaving off and cascading away, as it starts in the east and works its way west. And then the Mojave with its sand dunes coming up from the south and just terminating here. You may have noticed we have a, a slew of Joshua trees that look a little more anemic maybe than the Joshua trees you've seen in, in California. And while some people look at them as a weaker tree, I actually think of them as the strongest because they're actually the most northern Joshua trees. They probably barely shouldn't exist here, but they're somehow finding a way to survive. And so where that Great Basin Range and Lakes Inter sect here with the shaving of the Colorado Plateau and the Mojave, those three just lead to this almost um, insanity that we see outside in front of us now. And that's where the swirling sandstones come from. Uh, that's where you even see basalt and lava fields. I could take you just 30 minutes from here to lava fields where you would feel like we were in Hawaii together and they would be miles deep. And so I think the main draw to our region is geologic diversity and the fact that you just don't know what you're going to see around every corner. Mm -hmm. Wow. And Zion National Park became a national park in 1919. And then there was a Zion National Monument created in 1937. Yep. And then that national monument was incorporated into the whole park in 1956. Yeah, you're correct. Zion definitely became a national park in 1919 is when we had our 100-year celebration just five years ago now. Mm -hmm. And the Zion National Monument that you're referring to, so that uh, people understand because it is confusing, that's now referred to as the Kolob Canyons section of Zion National Park. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was incorporated in the 50s and grew significantly the western portion of Zion. So for visitors that aren't familiar, Zion's main canyon and many of the features that most people think of in Zion are accessible in what we call the south entrance, and that's in the gateway community of Springdale. It's also accessible through an east entrance, and both of those are on the same highway. But the Kolob Canyon section of Zion, you can hike to it, but you actually have to get on a totally separate highway, Interstate 15, and if you want to access it by vehicle, you have to take a, a separate route that takes you about 45 minutes outside of the main canyon. Otherwise, it's about a 11 to 15 mile hike 
to get across into the Kolob Canyon section of Zion. Nice. Zion Canyon is incredible, but it also is it's just a portion of this much larger park. And it seems like you could live here and explore it your whole life and only still scratch the surface. Yeah, you know, you mentioned it. Most visitors, uh, it's no surprise, are coming to Zion to do Angel's Landing or to hike the Narrows. And that's because that's what they've heard about and that's what they've seen. But I was so lucky when I moved here. I thought I was here to maybe hike the Narrows and do Angel's Landing. But to exactly what you said, it's the whole region. And there are so many choose-your-own-adventure special opportunities here. Trying to compare them is almost like apples and oranges. It's an impossible task. And when people ask me which is my favorite, I almost look at them like the question itself uh, is impossible to answer. So, yeah. You know, the average visitor to Zion often is staying for just maybe a few hours. And the reality is that Zion is so accessible. Even the scenic drive, one of the most common comments I hear as people hop into their own vehicle and drive through the south entrance of Zion, maybe they go up through the famous tunnel that's inside of our park. That tunnel at the time when it was constructed in the 20s at one mile long actually had the president come out and inaugurate it. I believe it was 1929, 1931. I'll have to check my dates, but it was on July 4th. And it was the longest tunnel in the country at the time at that mile long. Now our vehicles have outgrown and uh, larger vehicles have to pay an additional fee to navigate the tunnel. But still, what you can see from just that view, some people, since you mentioned the Grand Canyon, describe it as what it might be like to drive inside of the Grand Canyon at times. And with 2,000 foot walls, it's pretty close to a concept of what it's like to be in a canyon that deep. But even short hikes, Zion is very fortunate to have a diversity of hikes that range from uh, you know very easy to intermediate modern it all the way into the difficult for people who love getting out backpacking and roughing it in the woods but things like the Pa Roos trail which leave immediately from the visitor center don't even require you to wait for Zion's shuttle bus so you know if you have a short amount of time in Zion a quick stroll down the Pa Roos would give you a real sense of the immensity of the canyon and you're staying in the campground so maybe you have a sense of that even from the campgrounds my favorite question to ask is when people call in Zion and say well where are the best views I usually chuckle because I'm like, well, from just about anywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The past two nights I've been sleeping underneath the Watchman, which is just one of the many beautiful geological structures that sticks out and changes to an array of colors throughout the day. Let's transition to talk about how Zion National Park Forever Project supports Zion National Park. Yeah, you know, we have a unique relationship with our park partner, our origins trace back quite far, more so than, than many other nonprofit partners might for a park. The origins of our organization trace back to the 1920s, 1929, I believe. Um, citizens of an even smaller town that's just outside of the gateway called Rockville, uh, you might have been through, uh, now many people see it as just a little agriculture Airbnb community right before you come into Springdale. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, there were no rangers. Uh, there were no programs in the park and there wasn't a lot of infrastructure. And visitors would come in Union Pacific buses. Yeah. They were the ones running the tours at the time. And the locals who lived in Rockville realized these people didn't know where to go. Uh, if you've ever seen any of the time in the 30s, they used to sell these old infographic postcards. And they would have these really beautifully painted images. And in Utah, one of the common circles people get on was often historically called the Grand Circle. And you would come and you would start at this old uh, train depot up in Cedar City near a town named Lund. You would come across and visit Cedar Breaks, which is another national monument we support just 45 minutes from here. You would swing over to Bryce Canyon and visit our friends over at Bryce Natural History Association and Bryce Canyon Association, which we actually used to be the same organization if you trace our history back far enough into the 40s. And then they would swing down, make their visit through the east side of Zion and come through the tunnel down to the bottom and then on to the Grand Canyon. And that was often billed as a two-week trip journey through the parks. Well, as these people came through, the local Rockville residents would sell these infographic postcards and collect the money and many of those funds were used to start some of the first, they didn't call them rangers at the time, we would call them naturalists, yeah. and start some of the first naturalist programs in the park. So that's the origin of our organization, is really just local community members and friends who were living right outside the park, realizing that visitors were coming and maybe not being equipped to have what they need to experience the place, and then using the funds from that to help 
grow that infrastructure. After that, our organization in the 50s and 60s really transitioned heavily into publishing. Uh, we published a majority of the field guides for the park, a number of the hiking guides, a number of the plant and animal guides uh, to the park were published through us and we operated the park stores. As our organization grew, as most do, we formalized, uh, hired an executive director in the 60s and brought on a board, continued to grow our activities to where beyond just operating the park stores and providing the publishing for the park, we began, as time moved forward with our org, to provide educational services, to provide visitor experiences that were focused on sharing that Zion experience. And then also to develop philanthropic programs where we were reaching out to the community and providing businesses and concerned individuals real pathways to give back and sustain the park. We did that under three different names for the majority of our time. And then in 2017, realizing that that was difficult to share that message in a real concrete way with a national audience, we rebranded into the Zion National Park Forever Project. Mm -hmm. And uh, we continue that work with the park today. Mm. Let's elaborate on that work because it's not just educational and it's not just, you know, publications in the gift shop. It's vast. Yeah. yeah. You're going to hear me moving around because I'm actually going to grab you. It just happens to be sitting in the corner here and I'll let you take home. But yeah. the best introduction to that and where I'd encourage the public to really learn about our work is through our annual field guide. The reality is in Zion, we have more than $50 million in deferred maintenance. For people who may not be familiar, because I didn't know that term deferred maintenance when I started working in this field, that means work that needs doing but we simply don't have the budgets for. Mm -hmm. That means work that we are literally deferring or putting off. And one of the roles we play for the park is that each year they bring to us those top priority projects that they know need to be accomplished. They bring to us uh, between 25 to 30 projects that they feel they won't have the funding to complete, but they feel the project is essential. Some of those projects are very small dollar amount projects, a few hundred dollars to maybe buy some historical interpretive items or some new costumes for some interpretive shows, maybe at Pipe Spring, which is a national monument we support that tells the story of early Native American life, as well as the story of the pioneers who came to this region. And it focuses on a single source of water that was available to both people. Maybe it's uh, larger than a few hundred dollars for some historical items, and we have legacy projects. One of the ones that we're focusing on now in the park is the need for a new trail. I'm sure you've noticed, it sounds like you've been to a lot of places, maybe you've noticed the use of bikes and e-bikes has increased recently over the years, and in Zion, we're no exception. And so to your point about it being more than education, one of the needs we have right now is that we have a real safety issue with so many bikes and hikers being on the road going up the main canyon of Zion. And there's an opportunity we have with a project called the Floor of the Valley Trail to essentially provide a new 9 to 11 mile trail system where for the first time, instead of hikers and bikers, for anyone who's familiar with Zion's main canyon, having to compete with the shuttle buses, they would have a safe and separate removed hiking site that they could take that same journey all the way to the Temple of Sinawava, which most people might not know that name, but that's the start of the famed Narrows hike is at the Temple of Sinawava. Wava. The other reason we need that trail is not nearly as cool as just having a trail. It's that there's a real health and safety concern as well. A lot of the old structures in Zion are on septic systems, and we need an opportunity to trench as we provide that trail base to modernize some of the plumbing systems that run through the park so that we don't risk jeopardizing the wild and scenic designation, which is a very official designation, uh, I believe from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, of the Virgin River. Because although the Virgin is small, some people look at our, our river here and say, that's a river. I always remind them uh, that that is what carved these 2,000-foot walls in the entirety of this canyon. So, yeah, we work on projects big and small, some of them inside the parks and some of them outside of the parks. But the field guide, uh, which you can find at our website, zionpark.org, is a real depth and breadth of the work we do, whether it's with local community students, whether it's with trail projects in the park, or whether it's with the plants and animals of Zion. Um, that's everything from science and research to discovering new species to providing for animal welfare, like our iconic bighorn, which roam on the east side of Zion. Yeah. Well, let's definitely talk about critters. So besides bighorn, what other wildlife do you find in Zion National Park? Can I tell you about my favorite? Oh, of course. It's because I didn't know it existed. Is that weird that I made it all the way into my mid-30s and 40s and didn't know there was an animal that existed? Mm -hmm. 
No, it's not weird at all. I'm constantly learning about new apps. Good, because <laughs> I was embarrassed, and I had to call my wife, who is from Utah. Luckily, she knew that this animal existed. I was driving home. We maybe only lived here for a few months. And from my perspective, a monkey came jumping across the road. A lemur is what I thought I had seen. Full hind legs, long, long tail, opposable thumb, and very skinny and lean. I'd seen a few animals with opposable thumbs like raccoons, but this was not that. And I called my wife. It was maybe one in the morning. Uh, at the time, I was still working at Cliff Rose at that hotel. I was the night manager, uh, which I got to say, one of the best parts was having that canyon to myself at one in the morning coming down home from the end of my shift. But she said, no, there are no monkeys in Utah. There are no lemurs in Utah. You saw a ringtail. And I said, what's a ringtail? And although they have them in Texas where I'm from, uh, I'm a city kid from Dallas, so I had never seen a ringtail in my life. I think one of the coolest, most unique mammals in Zion is the ringtail. We actually have a project that we're advocating for in our field guide where ringtails are inhabiting some of our park buildings. Okay. And so we're working on effective ways to ensure uh, that we keep the ringtail safe and that we keep visitors safe and that we uh, do what's right uh, for both. So we're trying to find some creative ways to uh, help our ringtail friends uh, stay out of some of our park buildings. And the reason it's so risky is because, well, they have thumbs and they're yeah. crazy smart. So um, there's, it's really hard to keep them out of things. But um, yeah, Zion, you know, uh, uh, as you said, critters, uh, big and small, um, I know visitors are always wowed by some of the squirrels or chipmunks that you may see, specifically the rock squirrel in Zion. One thing that a lot of visitors are shocked by by our squirrels is that they're very friendly. They'll run right up to your back. I need to let you know that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. The reason that happens is because they're not afraid of the humans in Zion. And uh, oftentimes they're not shooed away. So we actually sell in our park store, a squirrel that's slightly fluffy and, and chunky, and he's got a little tag on his ear that says, hey, help me not look this way. Please don't feed me human food. Yeah. And that's one of the things I wanna mention about some of our small creatures and critters in Zion is that I know they're cute, I know they come right up to you, but feeding them human food really just um, makes them lazy, makes them no longer want to hunt, and creates other difficulties throughout the park, both for that animal, for the visitors, and for other animals that are in that food web and ecosphere. So, but yeah, Zion has a diversity uh, of mammals, and because of the elevation changes in the park, the only other one I want to mention, and we can talk about others, is the condor. It's the same condor in California, but uh, here in Zion, they nest in the cliff walls and believe it or not, we only recently, uh, I say recently, about four or five years ago, had our very first fledging in the park of a condor. A fledging, for those who might not know, means when the chick exits the nest. And seeing that successfully occur for the first time, and we tagged, all of our condors in the park are tagged, we, we affectionately call it 1K. 1K is the wing tag, it says 1K underneath that you would see. Really gives us hope that that population is starting to take root. I know with DEET and other insecticides, some people are so aware of the consequences to animals like the condor, but here in Zion and in the region, one of our biggest threats is actually the use of lead ammunition. Mm -hmm. uh, many hunters don't realize that while they think they're doing the right thing by discarding of the guts or dispersing of, of animal parts after the kill, that they're leaving that for other critters to eat. And you know that makes great sense, I get that. I might have assumed the same thing. The problem is birds like the condor are so susceptible to lead that even a small piece can actually quickly lead to death. And we've had a few instances of that in Zion. So not the brightest uh, story on that part, but we're so happy to see so many groups working so hard to educate hunters. And we're always so happy when we see things like ammunition swap outs, uh, where they're able to take safe ammunition that doesn't have those same consequences for lead poisoning with the condors. Uh, but yeah, besides the bighorn, uh, the rock squirrel, the condor, and my personal favorite, the ringtail, I think are some of the more unique and special animals in the park. Hello, this is Greg Robitaille from Explore Maps in Missoula, Montana. For as long as I can remember, I have been amazed at how my brother Chris turns his creative thoughts into the most incredible art imaginable. When we were young kids growing up in Toronto, one day our mom said, Chris, please go take a nap. 
But as fate would have it, I think he heard mom say, Chris, go make a map. And thus, I like to think that's when Explore Maps was born. Many years later, we have now rendered more than 60 hand-drawn artistic story maps of travel destinations worldwide, all created with the intention of connecting people in place and helping communities raise awareness for the conservation of our public lands and the wildlife and distinct cultures that inhabit these amazing areas. So come along and join Chris and I on this educational and inspirational journey using hand-drawn maps as the vessel to help tell these unique stories. Please be sure to use promo code MANDELA for your discount when visiting ExploreMaps.com. Today, the trail less traveled is being recorded at the Hurricane Utah headquarters for Zion National Park Forever Project. Zion Forever Project engages in collaborative efforts with federal agencies, gateway communities, and guests to create connections to the Zion regional landscape, leading to lifelong stewardship. I am here with Zach Almagar. He is the Director of Communications for Zion Forever Project. And Zach, this is a podcast. This is a radio show, so people listening can't see what we see out the window here. You know, I invite you to stand up, stretch your legs, and using words, can you paint the picture for folks listening, what you're looking at right now? Off in the distance, to be really exact, about eight miles from us is Pine Valley Mountain. Pine Valley is the largest mountain in our county and uh, the largest for actually quite some time in this this region until you you move to the next county of iron Um, i'm told uh, although uh, somebody in your listener world can fact check me that pine valley is one of the largest lacoliths as we mentioned earlier i didn't know what a lacolith was when i moved here but most mountains as we know i'm told are formed through uplift tectonic plates and shifts Uh, this mountain is described kind of humorously as an earth pimple Uh, the magma uh, literally bubbles up forcing it upwards underneath and it just never broke through and that's we're left with uh i believe pine is around 10,300 ish feet um but what makes it a little different than other mountains is you notice in front of it there um another set of mountains that are the the red cliffs uh as they're referred to that is a whole nother topic if we ever get to meet again on the complicated landscape we have here because you're looking at Dixie National Forest administers the Pine Valley uh, mountain uh, range we see behind us. Um, but a mix of organizations, including uh, the forest, local county land management agencies, our school land trust uh, within the state of Utah, and the Bureau of Land Management, BLM, all manage the Red Cliffs Desert Preserve. And what makes that Um, That area unique is that it's designed as a habitat for uh, desert tortoises and Gila monsters. Uh, One of my favorite things about Red Cliffs is the fences are only about eight inches high. And when people wonder why the fences are only eight inches high, uh, most rangers or naturalists will tell you it's because turtles don't jump very high. Um, So the desert tortoise... uh, um, uh, is unique to this region and uh, needs to be protected in that area. Uh, in front of that, you'll notice an even another set of uh, hills and mountains, and that's Quail Creek in a state park. So within that basin uh, runs Quail Creek, which has been filled in and turned into uh, Quail uh, Lake, which is our state park there um, just beyond. So again, to that complicated landscape, you have federal, state, multiple land agencies all merged together doing the common mission of protecting the resource. Uh, And then as we look just east, uh, you can see other sandstone mountains in the back very far. All the way up, you see additional snowy peaks off to the east. That takes you to the other lands that our organization worked with. That's the Kolob Canyon section of Zion, known uh, as Kolob Canyons. That's the largest peak in Zion, known as Horse Ranch Mountain. And then beyond, you see those snowy peaks way off in the distance. That's a separate county known as Iron County in Cedar City. And that's where Cedar Breaks National Monument sits uh, at a much higher elevation, um, along with Forest Service lands taking all the way to above 11,000 feet um, up on what's known as Brian Head Peak. And the fact that we can see all of that uh, from right here in this small window, I think is pretty amazing. Yeah, I think so too. Well, Zach, I want to end... Um I want to end the show by talking about the future and some of the projects you are looking to fund. 
as we speak. And then, you know, encouraging someone out there listening how they can get involved to support Zion National Park Forever Project and Zion National Park. Yeah, you know, we we talked about the field guide and the myriad of projects that we work with the Park Service to support. And the best part of my job is that these aren't ideas that we create. These are real needs that the Park Service identifies and brings to us to resolve. And one of the largest ones, as you said, as we look to the future, is the fact that visitation to Zion is increasing rapidly. In the last 10 years, visitation to Zion has doubled. In that same time period, the federal budgets are approximately minus 1% to 2%, meaning that today, those Park Service heroes that we exalt through our work every day are doing the same mission with almost double the visitation and slightly less funding. One of the needs that was identified to help support visitors about 25 years ago in a park general management plan was the identification for the need for additional visitor services on Zion's more remote east side. Um, In that same general management plan, it also acknowledged that there was nowhere within side of the park to provide that visitor center. With the relaunch of the Zion Forever project and our new naming in 2017, that excitement generated so many individuals reaching out to us, asking about ways they could help support. And one of the most amazing individuals we connected with was the McClaws family on the east side of Zion. And his family is the stewards and owners of large swaths of land outside of the park borders. And they were very passionate about ensuring that that corridor was not developed in the way that we see so many areas being developed adjacent uh, to our parks and our other public lands. And one of the things they did that we are so grateful for was donate an 18-acre parcel of land that is just outside the borders of Zion National Park. Beyond that, they've worked with us in other aspects to uh, establish conservation easements on other acreage of land they've held, including critical parcels that are adjacent to the gates of the park on the east side to ensure that no development occurs on them. But with that significant 18-acre donation and through funding provided by the state of Utah, uh, which I think is a phenomenal story in and of itself to see state and federal agencies working together to really provide meaningful infrastructure for local residents in rural communities, but also for the millions of visitors that come from around the world to visit this park. Um, We'll be using that 18-acre parcel and that funding from the state combined with funding from our stakeholders to develop and build what's uh, now going to be the new Zion National Park Discovery Center. Um, On August 22nd of last year, uh, we were very lucky to be with the governor, many state and other federal officials, including the park superintendent, uh, Jeff Brady Baugh and Zion to launch and start um, the groundbreaking of that project. I should more accurately call it a ground planting. Um, what we actually did uh, at the inaugural event of work was had each attendee uh, plant a seed into the ground of one, some of these indigenous and native plants. Um, and those have been turned over to various nurseries at academic institutions and in the parks. And when we're complete with the build, we'll see them return in a few years and become the landscape uh, landscape for the new National Park Discovery Center. Uh, but that new site um, and the new infrastructure going in there is beyond a building. It's new educational and interpretation opportunities, uh, re-envisionments of the Junior Ranger program, um, approximately 70 miles of new trail, including mountain bike trail, which for the first time ever will have mountain bike trails outside of the borders of the park, but providing new vestiges, new views, and new opportunities that are 100% free and open to the public. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm most excited about with this project. Not only will it create swaths of new jobs for local residents, you know, Kane County on the east side of Zion where this visitor center is being built is only 8,000 residents in the entire county. Mm -hmm. And the need for real living wage paying jobs is essential to sustain these types of experiences for the visitors. But beyond that, the new opportunities it's gonna provide for people who maybe have never been to Zion or coming to rediscover Zion. It'll really let them get their hands in the dirt, experience new things on the east side, um, and provide them a new way to kind of see Zion in all its form. And that includes agricultural experiences, uh, that includes Native American and tribal interpretation. Our friends uh, with the Paiute tribe and also uh, the rangers at Pipe Spring are working with us to create new interpretive exhibits. Um, so that's the thing I'm most excited about. It will redefine how visitor services are provided and provide uh, relief uh, 
for so many of the uh, the overstressed elements of Zion National Park. Mm-hmm. Wow, awesome. So if you're listening and you're as inspired as I am to get informed and get engaged to support Zion National Park Forever Project and Zion National Park as a whole, you can learn about all of these programs by visiting zionpark.org. Now, for someone listening who is maybe over on the other side of the ocean or the other side of the country, and they maybe don't have the... um, accessibility to come to Zion or they don't have the opportunity to come to Zion, it sounds like you can do it virtually and it's pretty phenomenal. Can we talk about that? Yeah, there's a few ways. Um, you know, the easiest way is nps.gov slash Zion. Click on plan your visit. The Park Services website is the best location you can go to figure out how to plan your trip to Zion. But beyond that, you can look for resources on the park website related to distance learning programs. Uh, whether you're an adult continuing education class, a small classroom, or if you have a friends group or other group, uh, the National Park Service in Zion operates a distance learning program. It actually broadcasts across three uh, three different nations right now. So Zion already is global, and you'll uh, if you sign up for the program, have an opportunity to connect with a ranger, ask questions about Zion National Park. Uh, depending on the age group of activity uh, participate, in, depending on the age group of students participate in activities or with adults, have a, a fireside chat and questions. Um, I think the best part uh, about our national parks is that you don't have to be here to appreciate what they mean. Uh, You can take the lessons that you've learned, the things that inspire you, and you can apply them in a local park in your backyard. Or if you can't get there, maybe it is just right in your own backyard. Mm -hmm. Exploring the natural world sometimes just means stepping outside. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well said. Zach Almagar, thank you so much for your time and energy joining me here today on The Trail Less Traveled. Yeah, thank you so much. I know you made a trek down to come see us, and we really appreciate it. But um, if I'm honest, I think Zion's worth it. So Yeah, oh, I think so, too. And that's how I'd like to actually end the show. Could you share three pieces of advice for someone listening when they come to Zion? Oh, yeah. I have to be honest. I'm going to put on my, uh, I don't have a park ranger hat, but my park ranger friends would encourage me to provide this accurate and timely information. That's plan ahead. Uh, make sure especially in a park like Zion that can be quite busy during heavy visitation times, that you've taken the time to familiarize yourself with the park website, familiarize yourself with park conditions, maybe done some research onto the things you might wanna do. And you know what? If that top list item that you wanna do and you show up might not be available, know that any experience in Zion National Park is going to be transformative and leave you with wow. Stepping into the gates of Zion National Park will leave you with wow. Um, But beyond that, I guess if I had two other tips besides planning uh, your trip to Zion, it would be when you are here, make sure that you are prepared. And I know that's slightly similar, but the heat here can get so intense in the summer that simple things like hiking smart by having a hat and a bottle of water can make all of the difference. Our search and rescue rangers sometimes deal with upwards of three to 400 calls for rescue each season in the park. Mm -hmm. And sometimes simple things like a bottle of water could have prevented the entirety of it. The third piece of advice I would have is have fun. And I know that sounds like a simple piece of advice, but you know, when you come to Zion, if you come open, if you come with no expectation of what it will be, and if you come ready to receive, I think what you'll discover will probably be something that we couldn't even begin to define in this podcast, in this interview. So I would just ask for anybody to come to the park, to come with that mindset that this is a space that is a sanctuary, that is refuge, that is sacred to so many. For many people, this is a temple. For many people, this is a church. And realize that if you allow yourself the time to be fully embraced by the park, and our superintendent calls this the Zion Embrace. He often asks to close your eyes, listen to the sounds of the leaves, listen to the sounds of the birds, and hear the flowing of the river. That's the Zion Embrace, he says. And to be honest, I think that's the best advice possible when visiting Zion National Park. Mm. Beautiful. Zach, what song would you like to end the show with? 
You know, I have a unique one. Um, one of our patrons had commissioned two fantastic songwriters, Anna Wilson and Monty Powell, to actually craft and create a song for Zion. The song is called Forever, and I think it's an amazing testament to what Zion means to so many million people. Can you hear it? The story in the silence Can you feel it? Calling in your heart Listen Listen There are voices In the rock, the wood, the wind there's a sacred spirit whispering within Listen Listen There's a canyon careening through the ancient sand There's an old chorus singing where the angels land Take a walk in the river and you'll understand Namaste Missoula, Mandela here, your host of The Trail Less Traveled. The Trail 1033's locally harvested adventure radio series dedicated to collecting stories and sounds from around the world. The Trail Less Traveled premieres every Sunday night at 6 Mountain Time and you can stream it live online at trail1033.com. If you missed the premiere, remember the show is also a podcast available every week. A few months ago, The Trail Less Traveled partnered with a small family business in Missoula, Montana, Explorer Maps. Explorer Maps and The Trail Less Traveled share the same vision, to connect people and place through art, history, culture, conservation, and storytelling. And for that reason, I am in the desert southwest recording interviews with our Public Lands Alliance partner. Please save the date. I will be presenting for the first time publicly about my 225 mile swim of the Grand Canyon, as well as my advocacy in Washington, DC on Wednesday, March 20th from 5.30 to 7 p.m. at the Explorer Map store located on the corner between 3rd and Inez in Missoula. The event is free, seating is limited, and children of all ages are encouraged to attend. That's it for this week's adventure, my friends in Missoula and around the world. But until next week, please remember, conservation is not a spectator sport. Living in Missoula is a privilege. With privilege comes responsibility. Please get informed, get engaged, and speak up on behalf of wildlife 
and wild places.